Hello and welcome to Bloody Bites. This is Jamie here on his own. And what I'm going to offer today are some nuggets, some chunks of history. Uh, they may be overcooked, they may be a little raw, but hopefully they're all totally digestible. And today's subject is submarines ducking and diving through history. And they are a fascinating subject. They've been around far longer than many people think. Leonardo da Vinci even had a design for them, but I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of saying that the Holy Grail can be found underwater. But I am going to go back a little in history. But first, I'm going to talk about that Orca deal, the UK, US, Australian deal with submarines at their heart. Because apart from security, submarines are key to Australia's security. And it's fairly obvious they didn't want 20th century diesel electric submarines, submarines that even the French Navy don't use anymore, as the French Navy have also gone nuclear. So the Australians are under pressure. China's naval strength is growing. They're pushing out beyond the island chain. Australia needs to get its oil uh, processed, refined in Japan and brought to its shores. And it sees a growing threat from the Chinese. So they needed uh, a new submarine fleet. Some say that the French lost out £27 billion deal, but that works out at over £2 billion a submarine, if you think that the Australians were talking about a dozen submarines. But what they really need is nuclear fleet submarines. And uh, the UK and the Americans are offering that. If you look at the American Virginia class of today, it's a large, large vessel. It's 10,000 200 tonnes displacement. It can carry 65 weapons, including 12 vertically launched Tomahawk cruise missiles, 28 other Tomahawks. Uh, the UK astute submarine, that's 7,800 tonnes submerged, and that can carry about 38 weapons. The French Barracuda class is a much smaller class of nuclear subs. It's really about 5,300 tonnes submerged and can carry about 20 weapons. So guess what? The Australians went for a more capable submarine. So that's where we are today. And I have a feeling the Australians will probably veer more towards the astute technology than the larger Virginia class of the Americans. But going back in time, as I said, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was tinkering with the idea of submarines, but obviously there were problems with propulsion uh, had he come up with uh, a workable design. Um, in the 1620s, Cornelius Drebbel invented a submarine that I believe was tested on the Thames, and that was uh, essentially made out of leather and hoops of iron and was powered by 12 oars. Uh, I have no idea how that worked underwater, and plainly neither did the English Navy of the time, as it was never uh, commissioned and never went into action. The first operational submarine was probably the Turtle, used in the American War of Independence, uh, launched in 1775, uh, oak covered in pitch, uh, powered by a sort of brass pumps, uh, and designed to lay a charge against the hull of a warship and designed to break through the uh, British barricade, uh, blockade of uh, New York Harbour. Um, it didn't actually work in action in real time, real life. So uh, that had to wait much longer for anything to go into action at sea in conflict. But by the 20th century, the submarine had grown in importance. And you can see that through the sort of two world wars. Um, of course, it was the U-boat menace in both world wars that captured the imagination. The U-boats at the beginning of the Great War, the First World War, there were only about 20 of them in the German Navy. By the end of that war, there were 140. 
by the end of the Second World War, the Germans had over a thousand U-boats built and about 780 plus of those had been sunk. So the U-boat became incredibly important and, of course, nearly brought the UK to its knees. If you look at the sort of tonnage that was destroyed during that period in the First World War, the Germans, the U-boats, managed to sink about 5,000 ships. That was 13 million tons, or 30% of the world's merchant shipping. Uh, in the Second World War, they managed to sink about 3,000 ships, but much heavier tonnage. So uh, the, the casualty rates were huge. In the First World War, it, it's quite a, an amazing achievement of the U-boats, given that most of the U-boats had to actually surface and finish off vessels with their guns because torpedoes uh, would not have a sufficient uh, technological advance um, to be efficient as a war fighting tool, as a weapon during those times. And if you look at this sort of key technology advances during the 20th century, the torpedo obviously was key. Uh, you know, it started in about 1866 with a Whitehead torpedo, but highly inefficient. And you know, even during the First World War, torpedoes weren't up to much. By the Second World War, they had really become finessed as a weapon of war and were working well and sank a great deal of ships. The snorkel came into being uh, quite early on. It was invented in 1916 in Britain by a guy called Richmond. As you know, I tell a lie. I think his name was Richards, uh, as Scots. Um, uh, shipbuilding yard uh, and it never was adopted. Um, the Italians then fitted it to some of their submarines in the 1920s but it was really only after the Germans captured two Dutch vessels in 1940 uh, 025 and 026 that the snorkel really became widespread and uh, you know, that allowed submarines to stay underwater longer and recharge their batteries submerged. So it gave them longer legs. It gave them a greater strategic value and made it harder to hunt them, essentially. So you had torpedoes, you had snorkels, and then, of course, you had the invention of sonar, or ASDIC, as, as the Brits originally called it. And that came about in the early 20th century, um, firstly, to pick up submerged icebergs. Uh, no bad thing, given what happened to the Titanic. But the initial stages of sonar, they were a passive, and then eventually they became active. By the end of the First World War, you got the Americans and the Brits developing active sonar. That meant pinging out a sound and picking up the return, a bit like radar and finding out where the enemy was. And that those two types of sonar are still the main types of submarine detection today, including, for example, the SOSIS chain, the hydrophones um, seeded on the seabed between the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap uh, that have been so useful in picking up Soviet and now Russian submarines. Over the, over the years, over the decades, and very useful during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So you had the Second World War. You, you had submarines not just sinking ships, but also um, taking part in uh, deception operations such as Operation Mincemeat, the S-class submarines of the Royal Navy, for example, HMS Scepter and others, um, being involved in Operation Min Mincemeat, dropping bodies in the water, um, landing special forces and commando teams. And that has gone on today. If you look at the astute class of Royal Navy subs, they have a dry deck that's there to allow special forces to launch raids uh, on the shore. And of course, you know, today the weapons fits are so much more sophisticated because you have Tomahawk cruise missiles that can hit targets on land over a thousand miles away. So it, it, it just gives submarines more punch and allows them um, more involvement in land-based operations. Post-Second World War and 
the greatest submarine, I think, in the Second World War was probably U-48. Uh, that had a tally of some 300,000 tons of Allied shipping sunk, uh, sank 52 uh, ships in the end. So it shows how potent the U-boat menace was. But after the Second World War, it was really the Cold War that came into the fray, came to the fore. And you can see the potency of submarines, not just as ballistic missile carriers, but also uh, in terms of uh, carrying the fight to the enemy. And during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, late 1962, you had four Foxtrot-class Soviet diesel-electric subs uh, crossing over to sit off the Bahamas, sit in the Caribbean, sit off Cuba, and wait until there was a war. And each of those submarines carried a nuclear-tipped torpedo guarded by a political officer. Now, had those captains received an order or simply thought that there was a war or if they were attacked, they would have fired those torpedoes. And that would probably have led to a general nuclear war. So it shows how incredibly tense, how incredibly dangerous that Cuban Missile Crisis was. And given that I was born a week after the last Foxtrot submarine returned to its base in North Russia, um, I'm quite pleased that it didn't go nuclear. The conclusion, I think, of this podcast is the usual postscript, the PS. And I want to mention the time that the period that uh, peps no who the hell are they um uh, pepsi yeah it's pepsi um the corporation the soft drink corporation um ended up with their own uh, fleet of submarines in fact at one stage it was said they were the sixth largest navy in the world very temporarily as they had a barter arrangement with the Soviet Union uh, where the Soviets supplied vodka in return for Pepsi providing their canned drinks. And the Russians couldn't pay. Uh, they were bankrupt. There were sanctions. There were the markets, their traditional markets for vodka in America, boycotting them because of what was going on in Afghanistan at the time, the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. So in the end, the Soviets in 1989, just as the Soviet Union was collapsing, um, paid their $2 billion debt or more by giving Pepsi um, 20 fighting vessels um, for scrap, basically, including 17 submarines, a cruiser, destroyer, and a frigate. So Pepsi had that navy, and I'm sure that uh, Western intelligence agencies uh, went through those vessels like a taste of salt, just seeing if there was anything left they could examine um, and analyze. But those vessels were all... Uh, scrapped in the end and Pepsi hopefully got its money back so uh, that is a brief history of submarines their importance remains to this day as the AUKUS steel with Australia shows uh, you know, countries need to have submarines if you want to project power uh, forget the aircraft carriers it's submarines that can do that uh, it can guard your shipping lanes. It can project power ashore and against enemy ships. So the submarine continues to duck and dive well into the future. And that's all, folks, for today.